Hey everyone, welcome to the Dill Pickle Movie Network. I am Dylan Randazzo and I'm here to talk about four films that I saw at the New York Film Festival. A lot of movies coming out one after another after another, so I decided to put all these movies into one review because I want you all to hear about these movies. I think they're all worth checking out to varying degrees. So the reviews might be shorter just because there are a bunch of movies to talk about here, but there are time codes down below for you to check out if you want to skip around in this video to see different reviews. Those movies are Wes Anderson's new film, The French Dispatch, Jane Campion's new film, The Power of the Dog, Rebecca Hall's directorial debut, Passing, and the new Mike Mills film, Come On, Come On. I'm going to start with The French Dispatch because this was the film I was probably most familiar with going in. French Dispatch, from the very get-go, feels and looks and breathes Wes Anderson in all his glory and this is some of the best of Wes Anderson's work visually and aesthetically I think Wes Anderson's films are their own aesthetic within the whole grand scope of cinema I mean you look at a Wes Anderson film you look at one frame if someone were to hold up a picture and say who do you think directed this it's very clear to Wes Anderson fans and people who are very familiar with his work what his films look like and it's easily distinguishable the set design the level of detail the attention to detail all the different props costumes the cinematography I mean you're transitioning from black and white to color back to black and white back to color I mean it is really really impressive what Wes Anderson is able to do visually with this film and I think from start to finish no matter what the narrative was doing to me emotionally I was always just so fixated on the details of the visual scope of things that at sometimes I didn't even care what the narrative was doing I didn't care how I felt about these characters because I was just so amazed by what was going on on screen that I didn't really care about the rest. That being said, I think the story is still very engaging. I think it's very fun. This is an anthology film. These are different little stories set amongst this bigger picture. The way the film unfolds is if you're reading through this magazine and each different story is a different article in the magazine. And it's a really interesting narrative device. It allows for Wes Anderson to dip his toe into different genres and different styles, like I said, while also staying true to his overall aesthetic. But different tones, different varying degrees of drama and comedy. It's really, really fun to see Wes Anderson play around with so many different stories all at once. It's not for sale. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Yes. The film isn't always striking you emotionally, and I think that's because, A, it's an anthology film, so you're only spending so much time with each single set of characters, and... B, because there are so many characters. I mean, this is a who's who of famous people in the cast. I mean, part one, you have Benicio Del Toro, Tilda Swinton, Adrian Brody, Leah Sadu, Lo Lois Smith, Henry Winkler, Bob Balaban. That's just part one. Part two, you have Francis McDormand, Timothy Chalamet, Christoph Waltz. Part three, you have Jeffrey Wright, Stephen Park, Liev Schreiber, Edward Norton, Willem Dafoe, Saoirse Ronan. And then you have the actual French Dispatch staff, which is basically the transitioning between all these stories. They're the ones who are editing this magazine, and that's filled with more stars, Bill Murray, Owen Wilson, Elizabeth Moss, Jason Schwartzman, Griffin Dune, Angelica Houston. I mean, so, so, so many stars. And I think because you're just so amazed and just overwhelmed by the amount of, of star power in this thing, sometimes the story kind of fell second to all the other stuff going on. But I think that's okay. I think Wes Anderson is just such an interesting filmmaker that there's always going to be something to latch on to. Some people are going to latch on to the story elements. Some people are going to latch on to the visuals. And I think that's what's so amazing and immersive about his work. This is one of my favorites of his work. And I think it's because it's paced so well. I mean, you have all these different stories, so it doesn't feel like any story is going on too long when the story over it just goes to the next story and it kind of flows super well because of that I mean this isn't a long film but all these short stories are long enough to feel complete and feel fulfilling I think there's also a great deal of comedy here I really really found myself laughing quite a bit I mean some of these pairings you wouldn't think would really work on paper I mean you have Timothy Chalamet and Francis McDormand a very fresh new face with a, a three-time Oscar winner but somehow their pairing just works so beautifully I'm naked Mrs. Cremens I can see that. It's things like this that make Wes Anderson's work so much fun to watch because you have all these different pairings of actors you never thought you'd see share the screen together, and that's what makes this so special. I think the only thing that hurts The French Dispatch, if anything, because I really do think it's a great film, is the fact that the first segment, the first part of this anthology, the first story with Benicio Del Toro, I think it's the most interesting. So when you start with that, the other two stories, the other two central stories aren't as impactful, aren't as memorable, aren't as funny to me, but I still think they're very good. You know, the first story, 
story was my favorite of the three. I also think it's the most interesting in terms of cinematography, the way he's able to use color and black and white. I think the first story really, really serves that use of cinematography very well. Uh, but I loved the rest of the film very much so. I, I really, really did have a fun time with this film. I really do recommend it. I think this is a great homage to journalism and journalists. And it's clear that even the people who have the smallest, smallest roles are still giving it their all. I mean, that's what's so exciting. I mean, I saw the Q&A. There were so many stars. Some of these stars only had a few scenes in the movie, but they were all there with smiles on their face to show off this film because they are proud of it. And I think that's really a testament, not just to the talent and their work ethic, but also to the director that he's able to have people come back time and time again to play just the smallest bit roles, but still give their 100%, their 110% all into those roles. You're fired. Really? Don't cry in my office. <laughs> Moving on to The Power of the Dog, this is Jane Campion's return to the screen after more than 10 years having not directed a cinematic ever. She's done some TV stuff, but this is her big return to the screen. I've actually never seen a Campion film until this one, so I didn't really know what to expect, but I definitely knew that she had a very, very intense and interesting style, and I think from the very get-go, it's clear that this style is unlike anything we've seen before in this genre. It is a Western genre, but the Westernness of it doesn't feel like any other Western you've ever seen. It doesn't have that robust, energetic nature to it. I mean, this film is dreary, it's bleak, it's intense, it's, it's hot. You feel the heat of these scenarios and these different characters and relationships, and I think that is what's so impressive about this film, is how Jane Campion is able to take a backdrop that we're so familiar with and put a story out in front that is so unfamiliar to the genre it is working within. The film is about a rancher named Phil Burbank, played wonderfully by Benedict Cumberbatch, um, as he inspires both fear and awe uh, to those around him. I mean, it plays with his relationship with his brother, played by Jesse Plemons, his brother's new wife, played by Kirsten Dunst, and her son, played by Cody Smith McPhee. And each of these relationships with Benedict Cumberbatch's character are so, so different. And I don't want to spoil any more about what this story is about because it really is interesting to see it unfold. At times, I wasn't sure what the film was building to. And I think the rising actions were all just so, so exciting that when it got to the climax, it wasn't necessarily what I was expecting, but I didn't have a problem with it. I think it's one of those films where if I go back and watch it again I think with every repeated viewing I'll start to make sense of what the overall picture is trying to say about its deep rich themes about masculinity and relationships and you know finding oneself and their loneliness and how they project their loneliness onto others I mean I think it's a deeply profound film it didn't go in the direction I was expecting it to and I think that's why I do need another viewing to really soak it all in and digest it but like I said Campion's work here is great I mean her artistry is next level I mean all the visuals are gorgeous Johnny Greenwood's score just really engulfs the thing in such a deeply suspenseful and um, edge of your seat uncomfortability that is just lingering throughout the film it's not to the point where it feels like a horror film or anything too drastic but you definitely feel a sense of uneasiness and I really really like that how the tone is just consistently uneasy throughout and you don't necessarily know where it's building but you know that it's getting increasingly and increasingly more suspicious and uh, eerie as it goes along and I really really like that I think the performances here are the highlight Benedict Cumberbatch is looking for another Oscar nomination here for sure because he just eats up every single ounce of screen time he is playing such a disturbed and disturbing individual uh, and it's just hard not to keep your eyes off of him because he is just playing such a different character from what he usually plays and what you usually see from a main character in a western. I think Jesse Plemons' performance is a little bit more subdued, but I think there's a lot of rich nuance going on underneath those layers of his performance. I think Kirsten Dunst is incredible. There's a scene involving her playing a piano for a group of people, and it is one of the most tense and awkward and heart-wrenching performances I've seen because it's so uncomfortable and awkward and I just really, really like this movie. I think it's one of those films that's going to grow with me with each viewing, and I don't really know how I felt in terms of satisfaction with the way the story played out, but I still think it has just so many different elements to cling on to that just impressed me and make me want to go back for more. The next film is Rebecca Hall's directorial debut, 
passing. This film is about two mixed race childhood friends, Irene played by Tessa Thompson and Claire played by Ruth Nega, who end up meeting up with each other later in life after having not seen each other in a long time. Now Irene identifies with her African American roots and has married a black man, she lives in Harlem, whereas Claire has lived a white passing lifestyle. And the film has some very very interesting commentaries to make about what it means to be passing, especially in this time period. This film takes place in the late 20s, so I think it's really interesting to see how themes of passing and themes of race and what it means to be in a relationship and a friendship with someone else who is the same race as you but doesn't approach life the same way as you despite the common thread of your skin color and I think that's what's so intriguing is that this does take place so long ago but it feels so fresh and relevant to today. And I think what Rebecca Hall does with the film to make it feel both old and new at once is really, really interesting. She sets the film in black and white to give it this older feel, but she still directs it with a modern sensibility that does appeal to a more modern viewer and a more modern way of storytelling that I really liked. I like that blend. I think the themes it is bringing up and the actual conversations around this film are probably going to be a little bit more exciting and interesting than the film itself. I think the film starts off so strong. There's one really, really great scene where both these women are seeing each other for the first time and Tessa Thompson's character is introduced to Ruth Nega's husband played by Alexander Skarsgård and I think it's such an interesting meeting and it's a really really awkward intense meeting but it's got such rich subtext below the surface and I think that scene is so good that the rest of the film while very very well acted well written well directed just doesn't have that same kind of feel and energy to it. I just wish it was paced a little bit better throughout because I think it starts off so strong. That being said, I think it ends in a very interesting spot. Again, like Power of the Dog, I didn't really know what it was building to, but it still leaves you thinking. And I think the best endings are not always those that are the most satisfying or the most expected, but the ones that make you think the most, the ones that make you ponder the themes that you've been seeing for the past hour and a half or two hours of this runtime. And I think that's what Rebecca Hall does really well. She gives you a lot more questions leaving the film than you had even going into the film, especially with such rich themes as these. So I really do want to revisit this one as well. Like Power of the Dog also, these performances are just incredible. I mean, Tessa Thompson and Ruth Nega, the two of them together are so, so perfectly cast. The Q&A director said they were a cyclone, the way they work together and kind of circle around each other. I think that's a great comparison. But a lot of the rich acting doesn't even come from the words they are saying, but rather the stuff they're not saying, the subtext beneath the surface. And I think that's what's so powerful about both these performances. I think it's a film that a lot of people are really going to like. It might not be the most entertaining film. Like I said, the pacing is a little slower as it goes along, especially after it starts on such a high note. Uh, but I think a lot of people are going to leave it having really resonated with the themes and really thinking about these themes deeper as the film wraps its credits, really just thinking about it and pondering it and thinking about what it means in the context of today's America for people of all skin tones and what it means to interact with people who are like you, but not like you all at the same time. And I think that's what's so interesting about this film. She's a girl from Chicago I used to know. Princess from Chicago. Things aren't always what they seem. The last film I'll be talking about is Mike Mills' new film, Come On, Come On. You might recognize Mike Mills' name from films like 20th Century Women and most notably Beginners, which won Christopher Plummer, the late great Christopher Plummer, his Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. This film is about a documentarian played by Joaquin Phoenix who is asked to take care of his nephew when his sister has to deal with other personal business. And it's really interesting how he and the nephew have not a tarnished relationship, but he's so young and he hasn't seen his uncle in a while that it's not the strongest relationship. There's definitely a barrier between them. You know, they don't really communicate the same way, but it's really intriguing to see how the two of them grow as the story progresses. And it's really about how Joaquin Phoenix learns kind of what it means to kind of take care of someone and be almost a parental figure in someone's life, but also how to communicate with other generations in general. I mean, the film focuses so much on what it means to be a young person and to have dreams and aspirations for the future and especially in a time like this post pandemic it's really beautiful to see you know these different clips throughout of different kids speaking about what they hope for the future and what they sometimes fear for the future it's so important to understand the next generation understand where America is going and understand these new voices these new people who are gonna grow up to be filmmakers to be film critics to be people who start great movements to be people who try to end bad movements you know it's really great to see Mike Mills make a commentary about children and not treat children like they're dumb. I think some movies treat kids like like they're dumb, like they're dumb little kids, but this film and Mike Mills in general just really understands that 
children are people too and they have their own thoughts and some children are way beyond their years they are very mature for their age and i think this child played so wonderfully by newcomer woody norman who this is just one of the best child performances i've seen in years let alone ever i mean this joins the ranks of like henry thomas and et jacob tremblay and room kvenzene wallace and beasts of the southern wild like this is an all-time great child performance and it's great to see how this kid has a more mature way of speaking but there are also parts of him that, you know, he has still not experienced the whole world. And that's why him and Joaquin Phoenix, as actors, play alongside each other so well. But as characters, too, the relationship between the two of them is so well written to where, you know, we start to see how they kind of fill each other's voids, the voids that they have in their lives, and how they kind of come to understanding what they do have in their lives already. This one just has something unique and different about it that I think is going to draw a lot of people in. It's a real sense of warmth and optimism uh, that these other three films, you know, French Dispatch is kind of like this fun, quirky, colorful experience. You know, Power of the Dog is super rich and heavy. Passing, same thing, very heavy. But this one just has such a a breath of fresh air about it you know it does deal with some very deep themes but in the end i just felt so happy and i had happy tears streaming down my face by the time this film wrapped and i think it's because mike mills just has such a great understanding of people and the way they talk with one another especially at different ages there will be so much for you to learn and so much for you to feel i think it's just such a heartwarming story. I mean, it really is emotional, especially Joaquin Phoenix's performance in general, seeing him come off of Joker and then give this rich, warm, nurturing performance. I mean, it's a really great 180 from the darker stuff he was doing with Joker. And I like the Joker performance. He's great in it. He obviously won the Oscar for it. Whereas Joker, I think Joaquin was really throwing all his guts into the role. I think this film, come on, come on, he's throwing his whole heart into the role. And I think that's what makes it almost more appealing to me because it is such a sweet performance, but it is also a very nuanced performance. I mean, it's a very well-rounded performance that I think a lot of people are going to be drawn to. I think the people who were almost turned off by his Joker performance are going to really, really embrace this one because it is just such a different side of the coin compared to Joker. I just think this is one of the films that's really going to stick with a lot of the people who see it. I think it's going to be a film that is on people's radars till the end of the year because it does have a really, really nice, warm, comforting feel to it, but it doesn't fail to bring up deeper themes and bigger themes that are going on in this world, especially involving, like I said, youth in America. America and the relationships between parental figures and youth figures and children in this world. I think it's definitely my favorite Mike Mills film as well. I think he is just such a great director and just taking everything that has happened both with the stuff in 2016 and then of course with the pandemic and just everything America's gone through. It's a really, really interesting commentary that is never cynical. Uh, but rather embraces change and future and uh, optimism and, and raising up young voices to tell their stories. And I think that's what's so beautiful about this film. You're crying. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. I hope you enjoy these films if you see them. If you have seen them, comment down below what did you think of them. And if you haven't seen them, comment down below are you excited for them. I have one more New York Film Fest video coming for you in a few days, and that is Denis Villeneuve's Dune, my most anticipated film of the year. I will be seeing it in a few days, and I will be giving you my review for that. In the meantime, please check out everything else going on in this channel. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. And thank you so much for helping my channel grow. We hit 100 subscribers. Let's just keep going and raising those numbers till we get to 1,000 and a million. One can dream. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you next time.